One of the most fascinating people I've talked to over the course of this show is Zeitgeist Movement founder Peter Joseph. Not only has Peter challenged the reigning orthodoxy of economics, politics, and religion, but he's also sparked an international movement of dedicated activists working tirelessly to prove that another world isn't only possible, but the blueprint for it already exists. Peter joins me now to discuss. Always amazing to have you on, Peter. Hey, Abby, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so, Peter, for those who aren't familiar with your work, quickly explain what the Zeitgeist Movement is and Z Day, which I'm excited I'll be attending in March. Uh, we're honored. Yes, the Zeitgeist Movement has been around since about 2009, and each year we have our flagship event called Z Day. This will be our seventh annual Z Day. Uh, it will be taking place in Berlin, Germany. Uh, we have a, a great five hour program and an, another event happening the next day, more of a social event. We expect a, a great turnout in Europe. We also parallel these events throughout the world. There's usually about 200 or so on average each year. Uh, and, a, and basically a gesture of global unity uh, for people, people to come together towards a new, sh new social system, which is at the heart of what the Zeitgeist Movement has been promoting for this time. Uh, to summarize the movement very briefly, it's about achieving a truly sustainable culture. It's about identifying that success is really public health. Uh, the public health is the ultimate measure, not material wealth. We have to you can you can debunk the idea of material wealth very easily because it goes in infinite extremes. You know how can anyone want more and more and more? Where does the satisfaction lie? So the true the success of a society is its identification with its place in the world and how we are in balance with society. And that's the new revelation. Uh, we see a lot of value shifts out there in the world right now that are trying to achieve better sustainability. So anyone that wants to look into that, the zeitgeistmovement.com is the hub, and then zdayglobal.org is where people can find information about Z Day. And I hope someone, uh, hope people can find uh, events in their area. There's a map, for example, that's up there, or to come to the European main event. And again, we're happy to have you come as well. Abby. I am very, very excited to come. It's going to be amazing. And, and you've described the Zeitgeist Movement as the new abolitionist movement. I think this is interesting. Working and exploitation and slavery. Why? Mm. Well. I don't think many of us have to look too far to see how mean and brutal humans have been to each other for, for eons now. And the question is why? Why are we, what is the stress that creates this need to exploit each other? Where has our social system come from? And these are questions that aren't really asked. Uh, the issue of slavery uh, runs along what you call a, a relativistic continuum. Where, if you're thinking about exploitation, where along the lines does the term slavery become a defined concept? Uh, this has been talked about by philosophers for years. It's very interesting, but I, I think to break this down, the, the goal of the movement is to remove the mechanism of exploitation itself, which we can do. It, to summarize where we are with slavery, to put this into perspective, we have the abject slaves in the world. There are more slaves in the world than ever before in human history. Now, it might be reduced by percentage terms, but because of population growth, more, more than ever before. 27 million. They work uh, in abject, violent conditions, unpaid in the brick kilns of Brazil, in the uh, charcoal mines of Africa, in the, in the Indian carpet looms. Uh, this is the abject form of slavery that we see. Then we have another tier of slavery that is occupied by hundreds of millions of people in this sweatshop transnational context that have been exploited through globalization. Is it really slavery? Is it free labor? These are the types of debates that come forward when someone who has nothing, who lives in an impoverished society, often strapped by structural adjustment and debt that has been coming down from the global community for decades. They have no options. They submit to transnational corporations for a dollar a day. I think we could see that that's high exploitation of labor, especially given the conditions. I think that continuum runs there. Now, where's the next late stage of this? You have something called wage slavery, which people hear that term and they think, oh, wage slavery, that's, that's, uh, that's just an exaggeration. We have free labor in the capitalist market system. There's no coercion. Uh, the truth of the matter is that wage slavery as a, as, a, as a historical concept has been with us since the ancient Greeks. Aristotle actually stated, and by the way, the Greeks were fascinating. They actually said in, that human rights, as a citizen of, of Athens, it was your human right to have your own slaves. So let's think about these values as fascinating. Uh, I love that idea. But he also said that uh, if you worked for somebody else, you were a slave. This mindset has been coexisting throughout the entire development of human relationships and economy for a very long time. And where are we today? 
what is the status of wage slavery with the vast majority of people that work for the owners, the true owners of our society, which have materialized in abundance as the 1% that will own 50% of the world's wealth by 2016. The, this coercive system that's been created, which really is no different than the feudalistic extracts of shadow slavery coming to debt peonage, to this imposition of coercion that is the social architecture itself through what's called structural violence, this is another manifestation of slavery. We live in modern slavery. It doesn't matter what you're being paid. You are coerced in the position you are by the system itself. And I see that, and I think the vast majority of people need to see that we have to end this exploitation once and for all, which we can do. Uh, the, even the pressures to end labor for income and the, 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 the looking at each other as pure commodities for exploitation is being presented by ev the evolution of technology and science itself because technology is now forcing itself into society because it's now cheaper than human labor. Right. So we very desperately need to get away from the labor for income system just to maintain uh, any type of stability in society because whether we like it or not, corporations are going to start replacing human labor, labor with machines anyway. Right. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, and I wanted to jump in there and talk about the Oxfam study that you just mentioned, um, which found that the richest 1% will own more wealth than the rest of the world combined by 2016. I'm laughing because it's just so ludicrous. How can we begin to change the trend if wealth is already so concentrated? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, that's why the movement exists. Well, the first mm -hmm. is education. People don't know what they want. Uh, people still look at this market as though, excuse me, look at the market system as though it is, it is a, a free labor system with infinite social mobility. That's been the propaganda. I mean, if I was, if I wanted to coerce an entire society and manipulate them to believe, uh, excuse me, to, to do my bidding and to benefit me in a very uh, exploitative way, the best thing you can do is to convince them that they're actually free. And that's what the capitalist system has successfully done for the vast majority. So you, education is the most critical part. Is there another alternative? And if people mm -hmm. understand the alternative, which is the natural law resource-based economy the Zeitgeist Movement puts forward, they'll begin to see the benefits of that. They can learn about it. And as far as the actual transition away from these power consolidations, well, I'll put it this way, there's more of us than there are of them. Mm -hmm. And given the history, of course, of governments abusing these centralized economic systems, I mean, it's clear why there's so much fear about it, right? How does the system oh, proposed absolutely. by Zeitgeist ensure liberty? Gandhi was one of the first to talk about a non-hierarchical social structure. He, he did not like capitalism naturally, he did not like communism. These are both hierarchical pyramid structures. Uh, they automatically condense power, they automatically create subservience in, in the way they're, they're created. The new patterning that's happened through what's occurring in the uh, science and technology fields regarding localization and regarding principles of efficiency specifically is that we can get rid of the, the pyramid structure and we create parallel lateral systems of development. The, the great uh, dematerialization, ephemeralization, the great rise in efficiency that's happening right now means that we can break away from globalization. We need to think globally, we need to think sustainably, but we need to act locally and through 3D printing mechanisms, through uh, shared renewable energies, through the Internet of Things, we're going to be able to emerge societies that are closed in the sense that they don't rely on the rest of the world and the exploitation of labor and, and globalization as it exists. And their power is condensed in the sense that they are the community. They control what they're doing. And they exist side by side all of the other communities that work in tandem through a larger order network. Uh, hard to describe, but I recommend people look into the Gandhian vision of this because that is precisely what is slowly emerging uh, through the advent of technology and the logic of what it means to coexist in society and be most sustainable. I, I take a very uh, amoralistic view in all of this. I look at what the patterns and trends are, are moving towards and this is what uh, a sustainable human culture that isn't trying to uh, exploit each other is gravitating uh, towards. Uh, a lot more could be said on that, but I hope that, that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. We have about a minute left, but I mean, is this, is this one system that can work globally, or is every culture and society unique in terms of what economic models will work in terms of their adaptation of it? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think when you get down to the, to the, uh, the science of sustainability, there really is only natural law. Mm -hmm. There's only the, the same principles that apply to technical efficiency in an economic context 
apply throughout. Uh, I don't know of any variation that can be logically deduced where uh, the extent of variation is so dramatic that you would say it's a different system. I think there could be variations within the structure, but the, the rigid formation of, of what it means, the scientific logic to be sustainable and to, be, have, to have a peaceful coexisting society is universal. So, I, I mean, when it comes to what's being produced, when it comes to what the interests of the community are and what is the shared culture, uh, the, the flexibility of that is, is given. So right. what people produce, for example, that's, that's built right into whatever their values are in their regions. Uh, all all cultural, cultural interests can be preserved today as, as they have, but they, everyone needs to evolve to, to respect basic sustainability Absolutely. principles on this planet. Peter, we should, we Peter Joseph, it. always brilliant, always amazing to have you on. I'll see you in Berlin, founder of the Zeitgeist. We want everyone to check out. Check it out. <laughs> Thanks, Abby.